Today's broadcast of Husson University's Distinguished Speaker Series is brought to you by MMG Insurance, protecting your piece of the world. Good afternoon. I'm Marie Hansen, Dean of the College of Business, and I want to welcome you to our 2023-2024 Distinguished Speaker Series. Today, businesses must continually acquire new information and turn that knowledge into strategy. To facilitate this process, Husson University, home of the largest business school in Maine, is pleased to continue to present the Distinguished Business Speaker Series, sponsored by MMG Insurance. This series, launched in conjunction with the opening of Husson's new College of Business building, Harold L. Fond Hall, in 2021, has included dynamic speakers from a variety of disciplines, ranging from banking, government and security, to management, marketing, and more. Its main objective is to educate students, alumni, and community members on the challenges facing businesses today and the related professions, as well as to inspire those who will become our future leaders. Today, we welcome Kyle Poissonet. I almost got it. Kyle is a 2008 alum from Smithfield, Maine, who is now residing in Biddeford. Kyle is the owner and founder of Catalyst for Change Wear, a clothing company based out of Biddeford, Maine. CFC Wear uses their clothing to raise funds for various charities and causes with a heavy emphasis on mental health and suicide prevention awareness. Since 2016, they've raised close to $100,000 for 40 charities and organizations. The items allow people to tell their story through a wide range of items that are printed by hand in Biddeford, Maine at their facility. The most popular being their Just a Kid from Maine design, which I'm repping today. Owned by over 40,000 people, the design that put CFC wear on the map is a reminder of where you're from and a point of pride for many. As of now, CFC Wear is owned by one in every 35 Mainers, including myself, present in all 50 states and over 40 countries. I'm excited to have this talk today, but I want to first recognize that Kyle was inducted into the Husson University Alumni Hall of Fame as a young alumnus back in 2012. He's appeared on Fox News, CNN, NBC, and been featured on a TED Talk TEDx speaker series. He's spoken to over 20,000 students ranging from grade schools to universities. More than that, he's an avid angler, dog dad, and a perfectly flawed human trying to let others know through his work, it's okay to not be okay. Welcome, Kyle. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited to be with you today. And you know, just kind of the first piece that you are an alumnus, so welcome home. It's been amazing. Um, when you gave me the tour earlier at the Harold Alphon building, uh, I mean, I came with a couple guys today too, and I just, the whole time I was just like, well, that wasn't here when I was here, that wasn't here when I was here. <laughs> so it's, it's really cool every time I do come back to just kind of see how much the campus has grown, mm -hmm. how much Husson continues to evolve, and as more and more time and distance gets between you know, myself and my graduation year and now, it's just really nice to come back and see how much is going on. Some of the stuff that you showed me today was just incredible. Well, I was going for blowing your mind, and I succeeded. The, my mind was blown, yeah. Um, I think my brain short-circuited it a couple times um, with a couple things that were shown to me, but, um, but no, it was amazing. Well, we really appreciate you coming back, and I, I want to talk a little bit about your journey, because mm. maybe you didn't imagine being up here on this stage back when you were a Husson student, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah, The stage that. didn't exist. No, so. it didn't exist, yeah. It didn't exist, but... Um, that's, I keep saying that to the guys mm. that came with me today. It just, um, it, it definitely means, I've been on a, a lot of stages, mm. but this one means the most just because, you know, when you're going to school, you don't, you don't ever think, well, you know, I, hopefully one day I could be back, you know, at a distinguished speaker series here. And yeah. Um, yeah, that's something I never thought, uh, truly never thought would happen or mm. anybody would ask me to do that. Mm. Um, but I just think it's great because like when I was coming through or when I was growing up, um, 
the people that helped me the most, the people that I found inspiration in were the people that talked to me, gave me their time, shared some insight, and that's invaluable for anybody. Um, if there's something you want to do and there's somebody who can speak to you in a way that maybe you've never heard before, mm. um, that ends up being 100% helpful. Mm. Well, let's take a step back, maybe even before Hassan. <laughs> Did you work before you got here? No, what never, did that never path had a job. Like? No, this is actually my first job. This my is only your first job, job. yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I did. I grew up in Smithfield, Maine. You know, it's 900 people. Mm. I, think, I think they actually lose people every year. No one's really moving to Smithfield. Mm. Um, but no, my first job was I worked at the, <laughs> the old, well, first, my first job was mowing graveyards, which I promptly quit. Uh, about a week into it because it was very scary. Um, but then second job and all my jobs thereafter were centered around like hospitality service. So my first job, I was 14 and mm -hmm. I was a, a short order cook and like a waiter at a pub in Scavigan, Maine. And I did that and then I, you know, I worked at like a dozen mm -hmm. dishwasher and then like I mowed lawns again and then I worked at a pool store. I worked at GNC in the mall. Mm. Is, is the Bangor Mall still a thing by the way? It's there. It's yes. still there? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I don't think there's a GNC in it. And I'm not sure that some of the students would know what that is, so you might want to... <laughs> uh, before the internet, um, you, had to, you had to go into a physical location to buy like your protein powder or your vitamins. Um, and I was the, the guy that would be in there and I would tell you my favorite vitamins. Mm. Um, so, so I worked there um, and played football through college. But growing up, I was thinking about this question last night mm. and um, the thing that resonates with me is that the thing that I enjoyed the most when I had those jobs when I was a kid mm. was like waiting on people or mm. like making sure they were having a good time right. and being a provider of like a good experience. Yeah. You know, so I was thinking, I was like, what did those jobs, how did that kind of, and when I walk up to a table, as shy as I was, I always mm. was able to speak well and like mm. do that. And a lot of that came from my mother who was a kindergarten teacher and a lot mm. of that came from my grandfather who was a fantastic speaker and did all this charity work in New Jersey and Rotary Club. Um, so I think just by default, I didn't know it at the time, but it was prepping me for what I, sure. what I ended up doing. Yeah. Um, but they were all the, the basic jobs. I mean, they were, <laughs> uh, if anybody's ever worked in a kitchen in the summer uh, at a, you know, a buffet or a pub, you mm -hmm. definitely know the smell. You definitely know what it feels like when you leave, mm -hmm. but it's fun. It's the first time when you start working, it's a fun, freeing feeling that you're, you're able to like make a little bit of money. And I know you had an interesting journey in college. Can we talk a little bit about that? Because you weren't always here at Hassan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I came here the first year of football mm. started. And I think every other kid in the state did then too, because it was the first, <laughs> it was the first year the football team uh, was going to be. Which gonna, was, was gonna what, be 2003? 2003, yes. yes. I feel super old now. Yeah. Um, Thank you. That was my first year here. So keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, we all came here. And uh, I wanted to continue playing football. And that was mm -hmm. the only thing. Thing I saw that was yeah. you know I was a yeah. you know I was a business major mm -hmm. but in my mind I was like I'm gonna play college football yeah. and uh, I did pretty well here I started every year I was here and at receiver and uh, at a certain point about halfway through I said I think I want to play division one football mm. and I transferred to U Albany in New York and it was almost like be careful what you wish for type situation yeah because you know, I went from here to starting mm -hmm. to I went to Albany, which was a much bigger school, and I was one of 99 guys that all mm -hmm. were, were you know, much more talented than me. And I kind of went there, and I kind of realized that you know, growing up in Smithfield, you always think, or in Maine, if you if you grow up in a small town, you have to leave. I feel like you have to leave the place you grew up or the situation you're in to appreciate what it was, mm -hmm. and that's what happened there. So nice. went there, played for a year, came back to Huss and finished. We're um, glad that you did. I'm very glad to. Um, <laughs> you know, but I'm happy I did it because mm. it's all part of my story. It's all part of who I was trying to be at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I met the first gentleman that I ever started, the first incarnation of Catalyst with there. Oh, wow. Um, and, you know, some lifelong friends. So I don't ever look back and think, well, that was kind of a stupid decision because mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's subjective. You know, sure. it could be a learning moment or a teaching moment. And um, came back to Husson and got into my, you know, played my senior season of football mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, sustained a couple of finger injuries. <laughs> and mm. and um, my, last, my last semester, my last year, I had an entrepreneurship class. Yeah. And the only, you know, the only assignment for the whole year was 
uh, build a fake business, mm. you know, business plan. Mm. And it was as simple as, well, I know some guys in the NFL and I like clothing, so I could just make clothing and give them to them. That was, that was my, like, we were laughing about this on a, on a <laughs> podcast I did a few months ago. That's the they were, they were like, wait this. a minute. They were like, your marketing plan was to just give it to people, <laughs> give it to people in the NFL. And I was like, I was 22. I just thought that I just thought that, you know, influencer marketing, whatever. And, um, and that's how it started. And I remember we kept it a secret all the way to the end of the year. I graduated and we launched the, uh, the MySpace page. Does anybody know what that is, or do we need to talk about that? <laughs> it's okay if you don't know what it is. Um, we launched the MySpace page, and uh, I remember it was so funny because you know everybody from like the people who worked in the dining commons to the the teachers to people were like, "Why didn't you tell me you were actually doing this?" And, da -da -da, and I'm like, "All right, well I'm graduated now. It was great seeing you guys." And like I say my goodbyes, and I moved to New Jersey, and because mm -hmm. uh, New York City was right there. And that's where I thought I needed to be. Um, Why did you think you needed to be there? Oh, man. Well, so again, back to this whole thing about what I thought I was and what I thought, where I thought I needed to be and how I needed to present the business and what I thought I needed. You know, this was a time in 2008, 2009 where Instagram wasn't a thing. Mm. TikTok wasn't a thing. Right. You know, I was telling a story earlier at lunch about like the first time I ever got to talk to somebody that I respected. I drove to Boston with a friend of mine mm. and just went like door to door on Newberry Street. Wow. And I happened upon Johnny Cupcakes, which is like one of my, uh, I guess like mentors, not mentor, but like somebody I, I observed and like was like, you know, an idol to me, like the way he built his marketing and did his clothing. And he got, he talked to me for like an hour outside of his store. Oh. And I was like, and then, but then I would go to like the next place and I'm like, will you guys carry this? <laughs> like, what do you think of this shirt? <laughs> there was no way to like get to people then. Yeah. So my thinking was I can be close to New York City. Mm. I had a couple of friends who played for the New York Giants at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'll just rub ovals with those guys. Something, <laughs> something will surely happen. And I love the positive attitude. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, nothing ever happened. You know, I found myself mm -hmm. with, New York is a very, New York is New York. New mm -hmm. York City is very, uh, it's everything they say it is. And as a, you know, a kid from a small town in Maine, I just was like, I don't think this is how I want to build it. And I mm -hmm. don't think this is what it needs right now. And moved back to Maine in 2010. Um, yeah. And that was like the next chapter. But again, I was still, I was still presenting it in such a way where it just, it, basically the shirt you're wearing now, mm -hmm. if you would have told me that was going to be the shirt that made us kind of what we became, mm. um, I would have called you crazy. Because mm. the shirt, you remember Ed Hardy, by the way? I do. Yeah. I have a belt. So like that, but worse. <laughs> that was like what okay. our shirts looked like in the beginning. Yeah. And it just was like, there was nothing behind it. There was no mm. mission. There was no message. Mm. There was absolutely nothing. So there was some inspiration what, from art, from tattoo genre, but that's it. You talk about the fact that you didn't have a mission. Why was that an issue, do you think? <clears throat> Can I be honest? Mm -hmm. My mission was just for people to look at me and think, that's a guy who owns a clothing company. Ah. And I talk about that when I go to high schools because mm -hmm. I was very much a victim of, well, I started playing football because mm. I wanted to play football and I mm. wanted people to see me play football. Mm -hmm. I liked football. Didn't yeah. like it that much, though. <laughs> um, same thing with when I was leaving. I was like, well, how do, yeah. I, how do I get people to think I'm still enough? Mm. And that was the next thing. Mm. And it, it, it lasted from... 2008 to 2013-ish, where mm -hmm. I just kept, you know, m you know, creating this idea that we were more than we were type mm. thing. Um, were you feeling pressure to do that from somewhere? It was, yeah, it was from myself. I mean, it was from myself. From it was myself. from myself. I never yeah. thought, I never thought that if I just went and did something else, that would be mm -hmm. enough. I always thought like I had to prove something. Mm. Um, and that can be, and I tell p kids, especially when I go and talk about this, like it's a very slippery slope. Sure. You, might, you might start getting down a path where you're doing things for the approval of other people mm -hmm. and you don't even really know what your mission might be. Um, and that is literally, you know, how Catalyst started. Sure. Um, was getting to a breaking point with all of that mm -hmm. and trying to figure out what was important to me. And even if it wasn't important to other people, uh, it was my truth. Mm -hmm. And that's what you should always lead in with business. Always. Mm -hmm. That's, we talked a little bit about this before you came here about authenticity yeah. and being you. Yeah. And that's what I hear there is yeah. 
this is important to me. Yeah, it's, uh, it's scary. It really is to, mm. to be your authentic self, especially right around the time when I started talking about some of the things I talk about. Mm. Uh, you know, it was, you know, to put your, you know, prior to like Instagram stories, reels, TikToks, whatever, like to just put your face in front of a camera and mm -hmm. just say something to complete strangers is intimidating to a lot of people. Sure. And so like my, mine started with a blog post and then, it, mm -hmm. and then it went to a video and then it went mm -hmm. to like a news story and I said it back on Channel 6 in the fall. Um, it was like a, it was like a feeling I never thought I would get, but mm. it was like immensely positive back to me. Nice. Like, ah, like I've been there. I know how you feel. Um, and that's right. when I realized that Catalyst was going in the complete wrong direction the entire time. Wow. And it just wasn't, it wasn't me. Um, yeah. So. Who were you then? Uh, I was a very scared boy slash man that thought that if I didn't do something, ooh, ah, with my life, mm -hmm. that I was a failure. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't succeed in this thing that I was trying to do with clothing, that I was a failure. Mm -hmm. um, which, by the way, I've learned as you grow older, nobody's, nobody's thinking about you. Like, <laughs> nobody's thinking about you. Like, uh, what is it, when you're in your 20s, you think everybody's thinking about you, in your 30s, you kind of don't care, in your 40s and up, you realize that nobody was thinking about you at all. Mm. Um, and thing, little things that people would say to me, I'd hold on to it. Like it was like this big thing, like, nah, you're not gonna make it. Like, mm. especially as you age, you realize that doesn't matter. Right. Like the amount of people that I know that are successful that had things said about them or, yeah, you're not gonna make it. Whatever, whatever negative mm -hmm. thing someone can say when you're starting a business mm -hmm. um, that are highly successful. And you just realize as you get older, the world's not gonna end if someone doesn't yeah. think highly of you or think a certain way of you. Um, so I became more of a authentic self and myself when I started talking about suicide awareness and prevention and what I personally went through. Mm -hmm. And that's when it kind of hit me. I was like, oh, People don't want this made up mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. They want like an authentic story. And if somehow that story can be told through clothing right. and we can raise money and we can bring awareness to things, um, that's, that's what it's about. And that's, you know, thankfully that is what I did. And mm. uh, I get to 100% just be the kind of crazy person that I am now. <laughs> like I get to, these people come along for this ride with me right. when I'm talking or I'm saying something in our story or I'm, you know, we're doing a serious thing, they're serious with me. If we're doing something funny, they're doing something funny with me. Nice. And, um, but that would have never happened if I didn't like present myself as myself. Well, so thank you for being vulnerable. Yeah. Because I do think that that takes a brave moment, but then recognizing all the good it's done. Yeah. Can we go a little bit further about the vulnerability and talk about the suicide awareness piece that's been important to you? Yeah, um, so, you know, right around 2012, 2013, um, that had been about five years since I left here. Mm -hmm. And I was feeling very down mm -hmm. about not seeing really much growth in the business. Mm -hmm. I was like, why is this not happening? Why is this not happening? Um, and because I had put on such a front for all these years as being this happy-go-lucky guy and being like this athlete and Kyle's like, nothing's ever wrong with Kyle, mm -hmm. you know, I found myself, uh, you know, my, the death of my grandfather happened, which I talk about quite a bit in a lot of the speeches. Uh, we were very close. He was the man who raised me. Mm -hmm. And that was extremely hard on me. And then uh, one of my best friends who actually went to school here with me, uh, Lou Avant, um, we, used to, we lived together, he was from Connecticut, my family loved him, he passed away. Mm. So it was like two really hard events for me on top of me just feeling like, God, I'm 24, I'm, 20, you know, I'm 24, I'm 25, like what is happening? Like why am mm. I not? And it's so, it's so crazy and surreal because you don't think, you hear depression, you hear um, suicidal tendencies when you're younger and you're like, that'll never be me, that'll never be me. It, was me. I would sit home and I would wait for my phone to ring because mm -hmm. I'm like, who's going to check on me? Does anybody mm -hmm. care? Does anybody, you know? Mm -hmm. And those things start happening and you're like, how do, you, how do you get out of this? How do you get to that point? Right. And, you know, Robin Williams, right at the end of August, uh, died by suicide. And that's when 
that was like the fourth thing. And again, I didn't know Robin Williams, but I remember just thinking like, oh man, I really liked him. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this guy seems so happy. Mm. And he wasn't. Um, and I remember I was just sitting uh, at a bar with a friend and I was like, you know what? I was like, we should do, we should do a hoodie for suicide awareness and prevention. And mm -hmm. let's make it lumberjack red and black, just mm -hmm. so it's the main suicide awareness hoodie. Mm -hmm. And let's donate all of the profit to the main suicide and prevention program. And every single person at that table was like, that's a terrible idea. Wow. <laughs> like, nobody wants to talk about that and wear clothing. And that was the mm. overall feel of the whole thing. Even the first time I went on a couple of news stations, they were like, don't say this word. Right. Don't say this word. And I'm like, well, how can I properly explain what we're mm. talking about? And, but we launched it. Mm. And it was literally 72 hours of conversation. Wow. It was like somebody would buy it and then they would write me a message and then I would respond and then somebody mm -hmm. else. And it was just these people like sharing these very personal details of their life or something mm -hmm. they went through or they lost a father or a mother or a friend. And that was when I was like, okay, like I, I guess I'm not alone in feeling like this and there are mm -hmm. other people that feel this way. Mm -hmm. And that was the first item that Catalyst ever did. And we just passed, this past year was our 10 year anniversary. Wow. of keep going, uh, to which now um, there are people that have tattoos of our stuff on them because it means that much to them. And I often think like if I never was vulnerable and vulnerable, mm -hmm. you know, like the amount of people that you'll meet sometimes, you got, we have guys that are twice my size that will come in the store that are, you know, army vets. Mm -hmm. And they probably wouldn't say it to anybody else, but they'd be right. like, hey, I appreciate that you... And you just sit there and you're like, man, this is what life is about. Like, mm -hmm. your vulnerability in something allows someone else to dream, fly, whatever it might be. Um, and that's, that's just what I've, so that, that line, of all the stuff that we do, that will always be the thing for me that is the most important and special. It truly, truly will be. The title or the name of your company, Catalyst for Change, mm -hmm. how did that fit with that line for you? <clears throat> um, well, it's a funny story and an easy story. Uh, we started with Catalyst with a K. Yeah. Uh, people kept misspelling it. And I was like, okay, time to change it. So I wanted to do Catalyst with a C. Mm. Um, Ashton Kutcher's production company is named Catalyst with a C. <laughs> so we started going through all the names. No lawsuits. Yeah, all right, the yeah. name, we started going through all the names of businesses. And I'm like, you know what? Catalyst for change wear sounds perfect. We'll do CFC wear for short. And mm. that was as quick as it was. But then right. through the years, I'm like, oh, it's pretty good. Catalyst for change wear mm. because that's literally, you know, we're doing a fundraiser right now with Maine Veterans Project. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, we'll do something with, I'm trying to think here. Uh, we just did some with the Dempsey Center mm -hmm. for the holidays. And the CFC wear, the catalyst for change is, yeah, you're just bringing awareness. You're bringing funds. Sometimes we do fundraisers with charities that it's their first thing. And they like, we're like the jumpstart for them. Hmm. Um, and it's, it's nice, it fits, it's good. But it was very easy to make that decision. There was just a list of names I couldn't use mm. with the word catalyst. And right. I was like, I'm just gonna make up my own. Well, and look at it this way, you couldn't keep catalyst with a K because you would have been KFC and we can't have that at this point <laughs> either, so. <laughs> Did you have that prepared? No. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, that was so good. Thank you. Yeah. That's more cool points for Marie today, so happy about that. <laughs> so let's talk about the business, because not only the name changed, mm. what you were doing changed. Mm -hmm. You know, fast forward a little bit. That was 2012, you come back to Maine, mm. and what did the business look like when you came back here versus today, for example? Um, way smaller, mm. one item every month. That was a pre-order. Yeah. Uh, because Johnny Cupcakes was like, if you have no money, do a pre-order. <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, we did a lot of like, you know, it would be like a fall hoodie. Mm. And then, you know, we would do like a Christmas hoodie. And then we would do, we used to do the main music hoodie. We started doing yeah. that where we would have bands submit to be on it. And if mm. they got the most votes, we would put their autographs on the sleeve. <laughs> and that was fun. Um, so it was a lot of like logo work. Mm. But again, there was still nothing with any phrases on it. Mm. That didn't happen until 2016 with Just a Kid. So we didn't do any phrase work on shirts until October of 2016. Wow. Um, and at that time, I was doing, we were talking about it earlier at, at lunch, um, I was doing every job I could imagine. Like I was mm. doing everything I could to support myself. Mm. 
so that I could go at the end of the day or the second half of the day and work on what I actually wanted to work on. Um, so your side hustle oh, is side now your so main hustle. I was side hustling. I worked, I worked the side hustle even after Just a Kid launched. Mm. And it was actually because I had a commitment through the, the, the summer all the way to the end of the year. And the last, <laughs> the last wedding I ever worked, uh, I was like bartending. And a woman was like, she goes, are you the Just a Kid from Maine guy? And I go, yeah. You could see her face. She was like, ooh, you doing OK? And I'm like, no. I'm like, I'm fine. I'm like, I'm just like, this is, you know, it's great money. And I just want to make sure. You know, I just, I hadn't, it had been eight years. And I just, it was so scary to leave a paycheck. Mm. It's very scary. And mm -hmm. I remember just kind of putting it off for maybe like mm. six, seven months. I think it was the spring of 2017. I was like, Okay, I'm gonna do this. Um, all in. All in, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I was the, the definitely. I know some people say you have to go all in on, on a lot of stuff. Yeah. Uh, I was all in, but I was also, you know, be, standing on my feet for seven hours, catering or doing mm -hmm. this. Or I was even in ed tech for a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew what my end goal, what I wanted that end goal to be, um, and I just kind of stayed as focused as I could. But far different now from then. When we hit 2020 with COVID. How did that affect you for the business, for was, you personally? That feels like 10 years ago now. It does, um, for sure. That was so strange. It was, I remember, you know, those first couple of weeks, people were just like, what is happening? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're at the mill and there's other businesses around us. And, you know, the guy across the way owns a cafe who, you know, does catering through the summer for weddings, he's closing his doors and going to get a chef job mm. because he just lost out on all of his revenue for the summer. Right. And people down the hall are like, hey, I got furloughed. Hey, the, and, I'm, and we're in our office and we're like, oh my God, like what, what is gonna happen? Right. Now, thankful for us, most of our business exists online. We mm -hmm. do have a store that people come to. Um, but I remember it was just very odd. And then I remember in the beginning, when face covers became a thing, or you had to wear them, right. uh, they were really hard to come by. They weren't as easy as they are now. Mm -hmm. So we talked to a supplier in California, and they were turning all of their old hoodie fabric into okay. face covers. Okay. So we're like, hey, we, you know, if we could get these, would, would people, mm. would you guys want us to get? And there, a lot of people were having a really hard time getting them. So we put up like 300 one morning, and we sold 300 in like 10 seconds. Wow. And I was like, oh, we need to help people. Like this is. Mm -hmm. So I ordered like 10,000 of them. Mm. And those went like in a week. Mm -hmm. And I remember just sitting back for a moment being like, we haven't sold a shirt in like three weeks, but we're selling face covers. This is the weirdest thing I've ever experienced. <laughs> but same thing, we put Main Strong on the side of it and mm. we gave away a ton. We donated a ton to people. I mean, I know people, some people had like events that they were going to and uh, we would donate them. Uh, we did some for Thomas College. You know, mm. they ordered some for all the students when they came back. And, you know, it was just a, a weird time. I think a lot of businesses were pivoting but the weirdest thing was we, we were the busiest we ever were with clothing. Yeah. Like it's almost like people were home and right. they, and we were telling these stories and I started making shirts about what was going on. Just mm -hmm. kind of things like friendly reminders. And we were the busiest we ever were. Mm -hmm. And it actually, I think for COVID, for some businesses, it, it really hurt them. But for right. us, it was like, I was like, well, I'm stuck in this facility, I might as well mm -hmm. start creating things. And then when you can put that out to the world and they see it, if people are stuck in their houses, you know, it just was, it was strange because yes. a lot of people that I knew, a lot of businesses I knew didn't have that opportunity. Right. And we tried to help people as much as we could and provide like a, and we discounted everything. Like all the shirts were like 19.99 or something. And mm -hmm. we just were trying to like give people something positive to look forward to. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was, it was crazy. It's usually the opposite, but it was our busiest year, for sure. So you didn't have to pivot far, which is an Not interesting far, piece. No. Yeah. No. I'm just thinking about your time here, fast forwarding to the current, where you're creating. Was that person that was focused on football thinking about creating back then? I was. I, I was, especially even farther back. Like mm. when I was a kid, my mother still has the VHS tapes, but like I used to produce TV shows on like oh. a giant camcorder, like yeah. on my shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> and I would like do that and I would like set up fake businesses around our neighborhood. I would always, I was always thinking like creating, creating mm. something. I don't know what that meant. Right. Um, but even when I was in college though, like I was saying to them, uh, you know, I really loved entrepreneurship. Mm. I really loved public speaking. Mm. And it's so funny because I didn't know what that meant. Right. I love that now. 
Like I get to like, I do like moth storytellers, I do speaking nights, I've, I've done TEDx. Mm -hmm. um, like I love like the idea of like that. And then I was like, well, I don't know, what can I create with this? And truly, like you saw yesterday, like mm -hmm. I get on our, I get on our social media and right. I tell, I'm going to tell you the story of this shirt and how it's happening and how we made it. I'm going to show you how we did it, the meaning behind it, the charity. So I was thinking about creating. I did not know what it would be, mm. but now I'm like a child. Like I am still a child basically, but because <laughs> I was telling them at lunch, like I could have an idea and I could put it on a shirt within 20 minutes. Mm. And it's like, man, I get to like do this in real time. You know what I mean? And because most people, if you have an idea, you kind of have to wait. Right. Or back when I started, I had to wait two weeks to get a shirt. And I'd be sure. like, this isn't really what I wanted. Damn. You know so what you I mean? had to send it away or set, uh, have I it did. go <laughs> my first, my first, uh My first shirts were sent away, but I uh -huh. basically started badgering local print shops. Okay. And uh, they grew to hate slash love me because uh, <laughs> I would always ask for like favors or can you print this? Can you stay later? And uh, mm -hmm. But I'm, all of those people are part of the story though because like right. the way they treated me, that's the way I try to treat people now if they have a question about something because it's like, mm -hmm. I bothered the heck out of this guy. Right. I could surely give 10 minutes of my time over here, mm. you know. That's so. a great perspective considering that it could be just as easy to say I'm busy. And yeah. Yeah, it's very easy to say that, but I just as long as I'm able to do it, mm. I love doing that. With the full understanding that I don't have the answers, I'm just sharing an experience sure. and you can you can learn from that experience. So speaking of learning, back along in our talk, you were talking about the word failure. Mm. When you think about that word today, and perhaps for some of the students in the audience, how would you describe that? What does that look like for you? It's beautiful. Mm. It's failure is the most beautiful thing. Like, as you get older in age, um, if you do not have the failures before you, mm. nothing, like, same thing. Like, um, when I moved away and moved to New York, I remember, you know, being in a New York Giants locker room and having a specific New York Giant look at me and be like, can I invest in your company? And I was like, oh my God, this is it, this is it. It wasn't it. But, <laughs> but uh, and even when people viewed us a certain way, mm -hmm. like when MSNBC called us, like, I don't know how that happened. Mm. But like, I didn't even have like an office at the time. I'm like, well, how, where am I gonna take these people? Um, <laughs> so it didn't feel good. Right. Conversely, 15 years later, mm -hmm. about a year ago, my phone, which I don't know how they got my number, mm -hmm. lights up and it's L.O. Bean. Yeah, let's and it's talk like, about that. Well, it's, it's <laughs> like they, so that means that they obviously took notice. Mm -hmm. It means that they, as an amazing company that they are, highly respected, they thought that's good. Mm -hmm. And none of that would have happened if you, I didn't look at my failures and go, okay, I learned from that. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was good, this could be better, that was really embarrassing. But when you get to that point where nice things happen, or like even sitting here with you, mm -hmm. like this feels great because all of it hasn't been a smooth ride. Yeah. It's all been bumpy, okay. you know? Like, and, it's, and if, you're not without, if you're without failure, mm -hmm. you're, you're never fully going to be satisfied. Mm. You know? And that's the biggest thing that I try to tell kids now where it's the easiest thing in the world to just try to skip steps because you have this in your hand. Sure. Like if you gave 20 year old Kyle 2024's technology, we wouldn't be having this conversation 15 years. You know what I mean? Like I would right. just, you just couldn't do that with me. Um, but truly as easy as everything is, you cannot skip the steps. Mm. You just can't and you cannot not fail. And that's what I always try to tell people is like, if I've failed this many times, my successes are right here. Mm. But these feel great because of this. Right, so. right. And that is, it's an opportunity, it's a way to look at it, right? It's a different view. Mm. So um, L.L. Bean comes calling, you're now in L.L. Bean, mm -hmm. and the Just a Kid from Maine is in a company that's known all over. Now I said in your introduction, you're already known in multiple countries. Yep. So tell me about that. How is it that you're reaching them? Um, funny story about that. Uh, when we first went in there, we launched in there in I think it was May 30th or June 1st of this mm -hmm. year. And they took Just Kid from Maine yeah. and Maine Love and some fishing stuff and some hats and some mugs, lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. And they gave us this immaculate display mm -hmm. in Freeport. Like it was the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, and it like turned <laughs> away. Um, and we were all taking 
that's kind of like what would sell the best. Because mm, we're like, well, sure. a lot of these people coming through here are tourists, you know, in the summer right. especially. Surely they're not going to buy just a kid from Maine. It was the number one seller. Oh, isn't that <laughs> Yeah, the shirt you're wearing, actually, maybe yeah. a different color. Um, but no, it was, it, was, it, was very, it was very, I will tell you, it was very surreal. It was very cool. Yeah. Um, it is still very cool. Um, but you... It was such a cool learning experience for me because they're such a big company. Right. And it was, you know, there was one month where we literally talked about uh, the colors that were going to be on the poster in the store. Mm -hmm. And if we were going to go with like a clay or a green. And I would like show my friends, like, what do you guys think of this? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it took a while, but right. it, it was very, it, when it finally happened and we shot the video for it that Mick shot for it, it did an amazing job. Um, when it came to fruition after all that time, it was like such, a, such an amazing feeling that, because I just felt like, okay, started this in Bangor, Maine in 2008. Right. We're the first clothing company from Maine to ever be in L.L. Bean, and we are front and center when you walk in the store, and I'm just like, I'm so happy I did all that failing. Like, I'm so happy yeah. I did all that stuff, because I just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't appreciate it as much. You know, even now as we're talking about it, I'm like, did that really, that really happen? Yeah, that happened. <laughs> pinch, pinch yourself yeah. and say, yeah. Yeah, but it was, it was uh, a top 10 core memory of my life for sure. Of just uh, feeling like even if I stopped today, right. I'd still have that kind of, you know, like I did that, you know, like we did that. Like people, people who followed us felt like they won too. Mm. Like it was like a, it was like a two day like roar of people that were just like, Yep, I started buying you guys back in 2015, and wow. I own 60 of your shirts, and they helped do that. That's you know awesome. what I mean? So That's awesome. Well, I, what I really appreciate when you're talking, I hear the humility coming from you <laughs> that, you know, facing from Hassan, that's a, certainly an important characteristic that we think of, but it seems to be important for you as well. Is that a good call on my part, that that's important? Yeah, I mean, life humbled me. I mean, mm. uh, it should help. I mean... Everybody gets to a certain point of humility. Mm. Uh, some people get there really quick. Mm. It took me probably until about 26, 27, maybe 28. Yeah. Um, and I just, I, it's, it's nice to be important. It's more important to be nice. Mm. And the way you treat people is what, is what ultimately people still care about. Like, yeah, social media is great, right. but you know, you, you meet someone, you talk to someone, you hear that they, like something you said, or they speak good about you in a public setting when you're not there, mm. uh, or they have a, a good feeling about your company, that means, again, you could have a million Instagram followers, but if 990,000 of those people aren't gonna talk good about you, mm. or represent you, promote you, yeah. stand by you, that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So it's more about how people, how you treat people, and how that makes them feel. And if you can do that within your brand, that's when it happens. I've just been at a point in my life where it, it, it serves no purpose to not be humble. Like, I don't ever think anything's gonna happen. Mm. Like, I don't, even like the L.L. Bean thing. Mm -hmm. I would joke with my friends where I'd be like, <laughs> it's probably not gonna happen. And if it does, whatever, because it was a long process. I bet. And, you know, or even when we, even when something has, good has happened, I don't ever assume that it's gonna stay good or be good or even happen at all. Mm. And if it happens and it's great, I enjoy it for a day and I let go of it. And if something bad happens, I sulk about it for a day and I let go of it. <laughs> and yeah. um, to me, it's, it's so, much, so important to be nice and so important to be humble because people remember that. It's better to be remembered from that than being arrogant or mm. being you know, overbearing. You, I'm definitely an entrepreneur as I'm listening to you, you know, I'm going to think of this new idea or I'm going to take what this experience is and yes. appreciate it and move next. All of these things are great examples for the students that are here listening, even our alum, even me. What else are you giving to, for advice when you've gone to schools around to say to the students, this is important for the future? Uh, it's easy. It's uh, my grandfather saying, keep doing what you're doing. Mm. Um, that's something he said to me a million times. It was the last thing he ever said to me. Um, I didn't understand it, and I tell mm. the story of why I didn't understand it. But we were talking earlier at lunch, and if you are guided by like what sets you on fire, mm. or what you get excited about, or 
or your adrenaline will pump for, or that something that you love, you can literally change the world. Mm -hmm. Because, like for me, it took me a while, but when I found out that I loved storytelling and I loved creating and making people feel good, it was just putting it together as what it is now. Mm -hmm. But like, we, we spoke earlier, and you know, some of these kids would want to do hospitality, and you could see the excitement when they're talking about it. And it's like, okay, if that's what makes you happy, right. go do it. It doesn't mean you're gonna do it forever, mm -hmm. but if you, if you lead with what makes me feel good, because like we talked about in the beginning, mm -hmm. I didn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> I was kind of going there, sure. but going about it the, the, the wrong way and for the wrong reasons. Mm. Um, so I always try to let people know, especially when I go and I talk to schools, I give it to them all. I show them pictures, I show them <laughs> the first event I ever did when nobody came. Uh, uh, you're doing all right now. But it's like, <laughs> but I show them that because it's yeah. like, do not make this mistake. Right. Like, you have every advantage in your hand. Be unauthentically you. Mm. The people that you may think are, you know, or be authentically you. Um, the people that are, may have something to say in high school or college or maybe in your early 20s, those people, if they're important to you and they're supposed to be in your life, they'll be there. Mm -hmm. Odds are they're probably not gonna be. Um, and just lead with love. Like lead with love, keep doing what you're doing because if you love to do what you're doing, you'll, you'll truly never work a day in your life. My body says otherwise. My body <laughs> definitely feels it now at 38, but I'm at least like very excitable. Every time I go into work, I'm like, oh, okay, like I'm excited to do this today. Um, I've been excited to come here and do this. Like it, it was something I was looking forward to just because like this still feels surreal, yeah. that you want to talk to me about, <laughs> about this. Um, but that's the biggest message I try to leave with kids, is like, don't let this happen to you. Mm. This was a, about a decade of my life where I really was shooting for the wrong goals. Mm. Um, and it was because I wasn't being true to me. And that's like the biggest thing I try to leave kids with. Yeah, and to be proud of whatever that is. It's yeah, just don't compare, it's, it's such a hard, thing to say to kids Absolutely. too, don't compare yourself to others. I think um, probably even any age, right? Anybody, I think we yeah, do for it, sure. So, you know, it's uh, probably most of us in the audience might say, yep, we do that, so. Yeah. Yep. Well, I know I wanna circle back to an idea, but I do wanna give an opportunity to the audience if there's any questions. We do have mics down at the end of the aisles, and I'm sure there's at least one brave soul that will get up and go ask a question of Kyle so he can give you more advice. Somebody's, Thanks, I knew my man would do it. <laughs> You're good. Um, I'm good to talk. You can hear me good. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, if, if this didn't work for you, like, did you have like a backup plan? Pro wrestler. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm a huge wrestling fan. That's <laughs> No, um, that's kind of serious, but um, I, 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 truly, I truly don't know. Um, I often, it, it would be something where I could create and I could uh, tell a story. I don't know necessarily if that would be clothing, uh, but like you, were, you and I were talking about lunch, like uh, I kind of recognized early, like I was like, all right, I can do that. Most people are terrified of speaking mm. and I don't have that. Mm. I get nervous, but I don't have that. Yeah. And I like pulling people in. Um, so I don't know what that would be, but I always think as years go on, as I'm doing this, I keep thinking, and maybe this is really what I was meant to be doing because I can't, I can't see myself doing anything else, um, which I think is a good thing because I know a lot of people that um, have really good jobs mm -hmm. and they just don't feel mm -hmm. fulfilled. Um, so it would, it would definitely be something like what you said, like something in hospitality, something where I could make sure people are having a good time, feeling something. Uh, it might be charity work. I mean, that's kind of what I do now anyway, but. Uh, I really like the people I've met through the Dempsey Center or mm. Maine Children's Cancer Program or AFSP Maine, the Suicide Prevention Program. Uh, when I see them interact and I see them do things for their job, I'm like, I could, I would definitely, I would like to do that, yeah, mm. so. Great, what else? Hop right up there, thank you. Sorry, he's a, he's a little taller than I am. I'm gonna lower that a little bit. <laughs> Uh, as someone that's from a small town myself, I'm absolutely amazed by all the success that you've had. What, is the, like, what does it mean to you to see CFC wear and just a kid from Maine and the impact it's had on a global level? Um, don't make me cry now. Um, <laughs> no. um, 
Ah, it's tough. Um, it, well, obviously, it makes me feel good, mm -hmm. but I'll keep saying this word. It's, it's, tr it's, it's very surreal. Mm -hmm. It's um, sometimes, you know, sometimes we'll get notes that will be mailed to us that it'll be like, you know, a, a piece of, no it's one's hanging up in our office and it just is like, you know, my dad, I bought my dad a warrior shirt. We do the warrior shirts with the different awareness ribbons. And he's like, you know, he, he's going through chemo mm -hmm. and it was like his favorite thing. He wears it during his chemo. Like, you know, mm -hmm. we appreciate you guys. So like you, you read that and you're happy, but it's mm -hmm. surreal. Yeah. And then you also get hit with, okay, you have like um, imposter syndrome. I still suffer from that. Mm -hmm. Where I'm like, ah, why does this person, like they really, like why do people like us? That's a hard thing to really, when people start buying more of your stuff and doing more of your stuff, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's, everybody suffers from it, but imposter syndrome is definitely a real thing. And I constantly feel like we're not doing enough and mm -hmm. we're not hitting enough people. And, but then I'll meet someone who has a tattoo. Like I've met three people this past year who have tattoos of That's our stuff. Awesome. And uh, I, you know, I'll meet people who they'll send us all family photos, like eight, eight people deep wearing a shirt. And mm -hmm. you're just like, that's more shirts than I sold my first year, like all in one picture. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, I feel grateful because getting people to believe in anything I think is tough. Mm -hmm. And I feel uh, thankful and I feel like it's surreal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people get that because yeah. this is like not the first time I've, you know, I'm always very thankful of like when people come into the store it's mm -hmm. like, uh, talk to them like they're your long lost friend, you know, and nice. just especially too, if they have a story and they want to share it, mm -hmm. they hit me with it. Cause you know what? The first five years, nobody had any stories. <laughs> nobody <laughs> was telling me anything. So I'm thankful for every story. Definitely. Mm. Come on down. Uh, my name is David. Uh, how did you get people to believe in your vision when you started and how did you approach and people and what was your uh, like your approach to get fir the first uh, client or the first person who could believe in you? Mm. So for vision, like we discussed in the thing uh, in the in the you know a few minutes ago in the talk it the vision was the first time that I started talking about mm. my mental health and my, you know, suicide awareness kind mm. of, you know, struggle battle. Um, and I think when you're being off, so there was no plan for that. That was not planned. <laughs> um, but what I saw was a lot of people that had this gap that needed to be filled where everything they were seeing in the initial stages of social media was like these perfect Perfect people, perfect brands, perfect, nothing looked, nothing looked real. Right. And I was like, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And we just went from that to breast cancer awareness. And then we went to, you know, something for like rescue dogs. And then we went to MS Awareness Month. And then we went to, you know, like food insecurity. And we just moved month to month to month to month to month. And, and my take on it was if somebody says, hey, you should do something for this, like, mm -hmm. we'll do it. Mm -hmm. So it was not so much about people seeing my vision as much as I was like, I want to do everything. Uh, and I want... And this I want, is where we have to rein Kyle in. Is yeah, wanting to do I want to do everything. But I also want to try to make people like, happy. So like some people buy Just Kid for Maine, think nothing of it, or they buy Maine Love or Local. Like, that's a cool mm -hmm. shirt. That's a cool hat. Mm -hmm. But then there's other people who buy the Keep Going stuff and refuse right. to sink, and they buy the Warrior stuff. And... You know, I've gotten a picture of a baby that was born with a birth defect that's doing so much better now that I met last summer. Mm -hmm. But when he was an infant, they had a warrior onesie on him. Oh. And she sent me that. And then I got to meet him like a few years later. And it's like, thank you for parent, for trusting that like you're, 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 this means something to you. And you took a picture and you sent it to us and you posted it. Um, you're part of his story now. So I don't... Yeah, but also, I don't think it's my vision. Mm. So, like, I'm, I like to be guided. Mm. So, I listen a lot to what people say. Sure. And if people are asking for something and it's something they desire, that's their vision, we'll just make it happen. Mm. I've always been of the mindset of, like, I'm not going to tell you what to like. Like, you tell me what you're looking for. Right. 
and we'll try our best to make it happen. So cool. And so you might miss out if you're not listening. Especially now. Yeah. I mean, when there's a million, there's a million options. Why would you choose, why would you choose us over the 10 to 15 right. million clothing brands that are on Instagram sure. <laughs> or in the world? You know, like you have to, sure. there has to be something there that, you know, people want to be part of your tribe, you know? Yeah. And what you're saying resonates with people. I certainly saw that you took on the Lewiston Strong cause as well. Yeah. Um, oof, that was a lot. Um, that was, well, first it took us like a week because the first like three days I couldn't, and I saw other people making stuff immediately and I was like, I, I need some time. Mm. I'd like him to first catch this guy first yeah. and then we will talk about a shirt. But I had a friend uh, of a friend who called me out of the blue on a Friday and she was the, she ran the whole ER unit mm. uh, at the Lewiston Hospital. And just listening to her talk, it was, it's one thing to hear about it. Mm. When you hear someone on a phone and they're, they're talking to you about what they've seen for the past week, um, she was like, I don't know if you want to like donate something or, and I was like, whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing one shirt, like you said, I overdid, I did five shirts yeah. and uh, I donated, I think over a hundred to the ER unit and the surge unit, mm -hmm. went there and gave them to them. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty intimidating. Um, but yeah, then, then we just put them up and we raised $6,000 for them. And, and I know we were one of the last ones in line to, to get to making shirts, but for me, I think it was just more of like a processing, like, you know, I wanted to, to make sure that we were showing respect to everybody involved right. just by not putting out something really quickly. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to think about it. And I wanted the, the stuff that we were making to make people feel good. And if that also, you know, paid for someone's hospital visit, then that was, that was just what we wanted to do. Because a lot of people immediately were like, you guys need to do something. This is what you do. Mm -hmm. um, and we did it, I think, in a week. Wow. So. Yep. Well, you've got the production part down quicker I got, now. I got the arthritis too. <laughs> yeah, so. Well, and you've definitely now brought Just a Kid from Hassan. Can we talk for a moment about mm -hmm. that campaign? Why is that important to you? I mean, I can imagine why part of it is because you are Just a Kid from Hassan, but yeah, tell I me mean, about that. Yeah, I mean, um, when Lisa reached out about doing it, uh, obviously the charity, you know, the food insecurity fund, I mean, that I love that there's mm -hmm. also a, a, a fundraising aspect to it. Right. So it's not just for, for no reason. Um, but it's important to me just because that's, that's me, mm. you know? And, uh, you know, I, I've done stuff for my hometown before too. Right. Uh, like my hometown had their 250, 250 or 200 year celebration. And they're like, oh, we want you to do the stuff. And I was like, this is so nice. Like, this makes me so happy. <laughs> but like, um, but the Hudson thing was great because I feel like, um, especially last year when we first did it, mm -hmm. uh, so many alumnus that I knew were like, oh my God, I didn't know you were doing this. And, <laughs> uh, and then even this year too, I've seen people sharing around, people are already pre-ordering pre it right now. Um, so it just feels good that, A, I feel honored that you'd ask, mm -hmm. and B, I'm just happy to like create something to help you guys with whatever you need. Um, but no, it, it does hold a very special place. Of all the Just the Kid stuff, yeah. um, that one is definitely very important to me. And I really appreciate that, you know, looking closely at what's needed with the Food Insecurity Fund mm -hmm. and donating back to that. And it is one of the things when I look at what your choices are, you talked about at the beginning, giving out your shirts to the NFL and hoping that they would take and go. Oh, man. Today, you're giving out to charities where people need it. And I think that speaks volumes to what your intention was in the beginning, mm -hmm. is to give back. Am I, is that a fair circle around for? 100%. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna steal that now. Okay, I'm gonna cool. start using that. <laughs> 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 no, yeah, uh, it's, um, I do often think about that. I think about like that time in my life and then now, you know, getting a tour of a ER unit yeah. a week after or something like that. And I'm just like, this is where I need to be. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, yeah, full circle for sure. Well, it's incredibly impactful. I think it's impactful for our audience to kind of hear that as well, that you were sitting, well, maybe not where they were because this didn't exist, but essentially listening to some other people that were here, some of whom are still here yep. teaching. Yep. What do you want to tell them now when you're looking out at the audience that you haven't said so far today? 
I think uh, the one thing I've learned as I've aged, and again, uh, I'm not that old, <laughs> but the one thing I've learned is life is long until it isn't, you know, and just through the last 10 years especially, uh, you, you kind of learn more about uh, who's important in your life, who you should give energy to, um, what you should spend your time doing. Uh, and that becomes more clear as you get older. But I think uh, try to do the best you can mm. with finding what you love. And it's never too late to pivot. Yeah. And you know, I pivoted when I was almost 30 years old. Yeah. And that's not old. Just can we be clear yeah. on that? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'm 38 now. Uh, so <laughs> still not old. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, but no, I, I just try to impart to anybody who's trying to do anything. And again, mm -hmm. I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. I can just tell you about my stories. Yeah. Um, whatever it is that you're you're wanting to do, keep doing it. Keep doing what you're doing because the minute you are excited about something you love. Yeah you'll be 10 times happier. Mm -hmm. And you'll just leave a very fulfilling, rewarding life, no matter where you land, whether you're in Maine or you're out of the country or a different state. Um, and then that will spill over into your personal life with how you treat people, mm -hmm. what you expect from people, humility. Mm -hmm. um, and this is coming from a person who was not that way. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I'm just speaking out of turn. Right. Like, this is just what I observed from myself from then to now. Yeah. Um, but you so, put the pieces of the puzzle together, and I feel like that's often what college is just starting to do for people is, what are those pieces? Yeah, but they're in the best environment to do it. I mean, just a little bit what I saw today, right. the students I met, uh, I was, just the way they think already about that kind of stuff and the way they right. speak, I was like, man, I did not sound like this when I was 20. We didn't think about missions when we were <laughs> in school. Like, that was not there. No. And I was just trying to make it to class on time. Yeah. <laughs> and I was trying to work out for football. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, that was about it. And it wasn't until I really got into some classes that I really, right. and I had some great teachers and people that were, like, so supportive. Mm. Um, that really, I was like, okay, I think I, there's some things here I like. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't trade coming here for the world. I mean, there's so many people that, lifelong friends that I have mm -hmm. made from here and new ones. Um, so yeah, that's, that, that would be the one thing I would tell people. And I think your messaging is actually sitting outside in the Gracie Atrium now with a whole line of your shirts. It, not just planning for just a kid from Hassan, but yeah. we really appreciate you bringing those pieces of your creativity here mm -hmm. and bringing that back. Are there any last questions burning in the audience? Someone want to take a shot at the last one? No, they get shy at the end. <laughs> well, here, here's mine is, um, what's next, Kyle? Um, I think I'm gonna look into that pro wrestling career. Um, <laughs> and the backup to that is? That's it, that's all oh. I got. <laughs> um, uh, what's next is we will be uh, moving facilities here at the end mm. of the summer. That's um, a big deal. Yeah, uh, we need more space. Uh, mm -hmm. We're gonna, you know, turn the store into a different type of concept of a store. Okay. Because as sad as it is, uh, people just really don't in-person shop anymore. I know. And uh, we want to kind of give them an experience of like uh, creating when they come in. Okay. And have it be like that. Um, continue to reach more people, continue to speak at schools, um, you know, improve production, improve our presence in the state of Maine, do more mm -hmm. charitable work. Uh, we would really like to expand a little bit beyond Maine too. Because every time I go somewhere else, people are like, why don't you have this version of the shirt for here? Like this would do so well in Nashville, you know, like Nashville right. strong or whatever. And uh, so that takes people and time and money. Of course, um, yeah. But I really would like to have people feel about Catalyst in different states the way they feel about it in Maine. Mm. Um, you know, and continue to keep maintaining the relationships we have and just continue to grow. I mean, one of the best parts about kind of now running a business is you can kind of predict in some lines of work, um, what the forecast is going to look like, and probably not great for my stress or my blood pressure. <laughs> but uh, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't predict that. I mean, I can predict a little bit. Right. But there are some times where we do things, and I'm like, I didn't even think this was going to be a thing, and now it's this huge thing. And, and or or 
I thought this was going to be amazing, and it really didn't do as well. Um, but so, you're, you're going to have a lot of change. Yeah, uh, a lot of change, and it's, it's scary. Change is, change is extremely scary. Um, growth is extremely scary, but I'm, you know, at this point, uh, very excited for it and excited to see what the next five to ten years will bring for us. Well, definitely keep going. And can you repeat your grandfather's statement one more time for me? <laughs> uh, keep doing what you're doing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kyle. Thank you for having me. Thank you.